Welcome to Freddie's Huge Ask Podcast. Huge lives and the stories behind them. And now here's your host, Freddie Cruz. Beth Ann Standig is a licensed psychotherapist and lifelong cowgirl who's trained thousands of CEOs, managers, and teams from Fortune 1000 companies, universities, and nonprofits through the Circle Up Experience. Her new book is called The Human Herd, Awakening Our Natural Leadership. And Beth joins the show right now. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Happy to have you on the show. Now, I'm in Texas. You're in Cali. I imagine not, there are not very many California cowgirls out there. Oh, there's a whole history of, of cowgirls and cowboys out here. Well, I know that there's the Wild West and the gold, the California gold rush. I just, I guess, I guess for me in the 21st century, when I think California, the last thing I think is cowgirls, but I think it's great. That's so funny. You know, I- People forget how closely connected to horses at humans have been for so long. It's really only in the last 150 years that we have not had them part of our everyday life. But the area where I live, which is in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, there's a lot of open space. And so there's a whole culture of, of horse people out here. And um, a lot of the land that's open space is grazed by cattle to help with fire prevention and also to keep the ecosystems balanced. I was today years old when I found out there was a lot of open space in San Francisco with a bunch of horses and cattle that yeah. are preventing fires. Wow, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, not necessarily in San Francisco proper, but in the Bay Area, the Bay Area in, the in general, of Silicon I guess. Valley, or on the outskirts of Silicon Valley, you are surrounded by redwood forests and these beautiful oak clad hills. And um, it's a, the one of the values of this area is protecting open space. And so it's really great for people that like to do outdoor activities and animal people because we we get to enjoy that. Yeah, well, and horses are incredible creatures because, as you said, I mean, they've been with, they're like, I guess, from early on in human history, they're kind of like like dogs are to us now. And I don't, if, if, I don't know if you, you might I see my, my dog <laughs> popping in on the Zoom yeah. video every now and then, but uh, um, yeah. No, we've um, been partnering with animals for a very long time in our, our species, and you'll see, I have a whole sea of dogs at my feet. So they're the mull about as I'm working and sometimes crawl up in my lap to say hi. And it's great. I mean, we, I think, you know, as, as mammals ourselves, it's so important for us to be in interspecies relationships so that we stay connected to that part of ourselves. Well, yeah, we learn from a young age that we're mammals when we're learning all about the animal kingdom and the, the genus and the species and all the, the scientific yeah. terms. Um, as a grown up. I've heard references to the monkey mind and the lizard brain, and we're just a bunch of meat suit animals wandering <laughs> around this spinning rock in the infinite universe. But you're all about coaching people through these through these horses. So I got to know what led you to this particular style. Like, what drew you into horses? Was that deep seated from your childhood? Yeah, I was drawn to the animals at a very young age. Um, I think because of their presence and authenticity and honesty, and I saw such a difference in the, the human way of doing things. And I remember at a pretty young age, noticing that difference, but I think children are attracted to animals because of that genuineness and of connection. Like you'll see kids make friends with kids so quickly. And the same thing's true with the animals. I mean, they really, whereas adults, you know, we, we have so many layers of, um, thinking and judging and, and social anxieties that get in the way of, of developing connection with others. But if you watch kids and animals, they get up and running in their relationships really fast, either, you know, and in kids with animals, you'll see as well, where the animals gravitate to children and it's because of that genuineness. So at a young age, I really gravitated to them because I found more solace in the connection with them than I did with my own species. And that became a problem for me. It was definitely a way to bypass some of my own growth and, um, and a way that I held myself back in my human relationships. And so over time, I really let the animals in my life, they've always led me to what I've needed to do personally, professionally. And I've just always listened to 
those relationships and what they've guided me to do. And, um, and I've, you know, I've, when I've been a teacher, I've brought my dogs with me to teach as a psychotherapist, I would bring my dogs to my psychotherapy office. And then I've had this horse piece going on my whole life. And you can't take the horses to the psychotherapy office. So what happens is you build a ranch and you make everybody come see you there with your herd. And that's what I did. Yeah. Well, and I want to go back to kids being drawn to animals. I wonder if that's, is that because humans from a young age are not old enough? They don't have the the wisdom to learn that there are bad things in the world, whatever those bad things may be. So they're, they're more, they're more open to trusting certain outside factors, hence animals being these incredible living creatures that, I mean, if you're an, if you're a kid with a wandering imagination, how is this thing even real? It's got four (laughs) legs and floppy ears and a long nose and it's wet and spongy. This is like something out of a movie. I know. Well, we're so connected to our bodies when we're younger and our bodies are the, the place where our curiosity begins, our curiosity begins in the body. And so that, and it's not been filtered and it hasn't been layered with any kind of, it hasn't been over-socialized. And so, yeah, we're taught when we're younger that we're mammals, like, and we see each other on, we see ourselves where we're situated in the animal kingdom and on the food chain, but we've also been socialized out of the animal kingdom in many ways. And we have grown as a species to see ourselves as very separate from, but as children, I don't think we see ourselves as separate from, and that openness of curiosity and what we're drawn to, it doesn't have a break system. So on the one hand, you know, you'll see like toddlers sticking their faces in the, the you know, dog's mouth and you're like, Ooh, yeah, I kind of need a break system there. Right. But yeah. on the other hand, you'll see animals and children gravitate to each other and able to navigate the relationship with this eagerness and pureness and just this desire to be in the connection of the moment. And I mean, I watch that my, my horses will always go to the children first and my horses don't work. We don't do like treats and, you know, it's all about relationship here. We don't bribe others to be in relationship is about presence. And so, and I'd say a hundred percent of the time they'll go to the kids and, and it's, and then they'll go to the adults that have the purest presence where they're not holding back. Mm. And I think that kids pick that up in the animals as well. And they see adults and the way that we constrain our spirit, our spirits, the way that we constrain our hearts. We don't really let all that desire for connection be felt out in the world and for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, well, and something that you touch on in the book, The Human Herd, is that it's it's difficult for us humans, uh, collectively speaking, to grasp the idea that we are animals. Yeah, people don't love to hear that. <laughs> we, we are very... Um, we What we love about ourselves is our intellect and our ability to think and... Um, innovate and create tools and technology and, um, and to talk. We're very chatty mammals and it's a huge part of how a lot of us live. There's still cultures all over the world that are very connected to their mammal selves. And I think when COVID hit, because it was so focused around physical health and the body, and we had to get very connected to the mammal part of us around our safety And it was such a global experience that we, you know, any of the ways that we use intellect and technology to make our lives seemingly simpler or easier, um, that all gets stripped away when it comes down to physical safety, which happened to all of us. But we do tend to, uh, for the most part, I'm making a generalization here, but humans do put higher value on the thinking part of ourselves and not necessarily the emotional, physical, and I would say this primitive mammal part of ourselves that's instinct driven. How much of that do you think factors into knowing that we are the only species that is actually conscious of our own mortality? 
Oh, what an amazing question. I've not, I don't think I've been ever been asked this before. Um, you can thank Robert Greene for that. <laughs> I mean, it brings up a whole question around spirituality and, mm. um, I mean, the neocortex and our ability to make meaning out of our experience and to see the, that part of our brain is able to see ourselves in a timeline yeah. with the end, the end point being death. And so it does keep us pretty preoccupied with trying to make meaning out of these existential questions of how we're living our lives. And it's, it is a pretty big distraction, which came first though, you know, and there's this great book called the denial of death by Ernest Becker. And he, he talks about how there's all the ways that the human brain has evolved and our, and our, our, our psyches have evolved to avoid the constant knowledge of our own death at any given moment. <laughs> like if we were aware of our own deaths at any given, you know, at every given moment, we'd be paralyzed with fear. Oh yeah. And um, yeah, but it, I think it does keep that thinker awfully busy. Um, but interestingly, we're aware of our own death, but we're very disconnected with mm. these very simple signals the body's trying to give us about our survival. And so if you look at like, well, there were this mammal that's so conscious of death and yet we're the, we're the ones with all the stress diseases that we cause through our lifestyles. It was fascinating. Like we are the worst mammals at self-care on the planet. Well, yeah. And, and to me it, it, it's, well, I think depending on who you talk to, you could attribute that to abundance, but then you start to kind of peel back the layers. Okay. Well, why do we have so much abundance, particularly here in the United States and elsewhere in the West in Europe, Canada, whatnot, South America, like second and first world countries, I guess um, we've got so much abundance. Right. And then yeah. you think, well, why do we have that abundance? Well, it's because um, once upon a time we didn't have abundance. We couldn't even, we didn't even know where our food was going to get. We were worried about getting chased down by saber tooth tigers. What right. are you talk <laughs> Who are you to judge me, buddy? Um, yeah, I know. And then we just became resource hoarders who do a lot of thinking and talking. Like that's pretty yeah. much like that's, that's the end game here. And so it's like, well, so how do we step that back a little and we can still have abundance and we can still have um, really lovely resources that do make our lives have a lot of ease, but how do we also stay connected to this natural part of ourselves that doesn't keep swinging us wildly from numbness to overwhelm and yeah. on the stress cycle that is so bad for our bodies and for our relationships? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I wonder, I wonder if it's, is, I wonder if it's as easy as people having these really in-depth conversations and a lot of everybody else watching or listening to these conversations right. and then realizing, hey, what if we just used all of this really cool stuff as a tool instead of something to binge to account for whatever it is that's going on that we're kind of feeling down about? Well, usually what we're feeling down about is that we're not having a need met and we don't know we're not having a need met if we're numb. And so a lot of the way that we're, the ways that we're living, if we're very busy or we're flooded by, by abundance, you know, but whether it's technology abundance or, you know, rolling in dollar bills, you know, you're just, it, you know, even the way that we eat where we're overeating to the point of numbness and um, any, anytime we're doing that, we're usually masking that we're not actually having a need met. And so I think if we started having more conversations about what we're needing all day, every day, and just having more awareness around that. And that's really what I learned with the herd. They're very connected all the time as prey animals with their own needs, the needs of the group and how they're, those are changing. Those are, those needs change all day, every day. And so they're making all these micro adjustments and I think that, that humans, we, when we do become aware of our needs, we're usually in crisis. And so we make giant adjustments that are really hard to maintain. And then that actually just creates more pressure and stress rather than little adjustments, just as simple as, you know, how did I start my day? 
And did I start with enough of a slow pace that I could have all parts of me being present? And, you know, if I'm not in survival mode, meaning that I'm not in a war-torn country, I, I don't have violence in my home, you know, I'm making an assumption here that there's like some exceptions, like there, you know, if that's not happening, then if I'm operating and jumping into action for no good reason, I am actually giving up my sense of ease right out of the gate. And I'm probably going to live the rest of my day like that. And yeah, that's it no does way to lead. live. It's not, I mean, it's, 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 it's survival mode. It's not living. Yeah. Well, and something that blew my mind was the fact that 80% of our thoughts are negative and 95% are repetitive, which kind of goes back to <laughs> what you're talking about being on survival mode. It's like, Oh, wait, no, I got to do that. No, I got to do that. No. Did you do that? Did you do it yet? No, you didn't. Are you, when are you going to get to it? How are you going right. to get it? How's it going to get accomplished? When's it going to get done? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> so how, how much, how much of a problem do you real, how much of a problem do you think this is and yeah. what can we do to alleviate this kind of pressure, this unnecessary pressure that we're putting on ourselves? I think the first thing is we have to study our own pressure system and look at what the sources are. And so for some people it is, there's a lot of that pressure comes from a lot of thinking that's driving behavior. And, um, and there are a bunch of repetitive, I like call them like exhaust thoughts. They're like coming from like the muffler of your brain and, um, you know, that, and the way it works and, you know, the like simplest terms, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but I love studying neuroscience as a lay person, but, um, that neurons that fire together, wire together. Mm. And so, and neurological or biological states, if you repeat them, become traits, they become traits. So neurons that fire together, wire together and states become traits. Huh. So if we know that, you know, we know there's this connection between our thoughts and how they impact our emotions and our behaviors. And one of the reasons I work with animals and really try to work with people as mammals is I want to look at what's the observable behavior. And because a lot of our behaviors are driving, like if we stop a behavior, it creates a state change immediately. Yeah. And we know that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to make a huge assumption and that is humans have to have a certain amount of negative thoughts because I think that's kind of how we assess threats and that's probably yeah. how humanity has progressed, right? We didn't, you know, our ancestors didn't get all, didn't all get killed by these saber toothed tigers. So that's right. how you and I ended up here, right? But how can, how can having too many of them, well, I guess what, what kinds of negative thoughts in your, in your eyes mm -hmm. are, are actually okay to have. I use, uh, it's a, a, I love your question so much. This is so much fun. So, Thank you. um, it's a great question and I'll use an example that happens with the horses often. So groups that come here, whether they're corporate teams or I'm um, teaching an introduction to natural leadership and it's, you know, people that are coming for their own personal development, we do all kinds of groups here. And, um, there's invariably there's people that are nervous about horses and they will say they're scared of horses. And I used to just believe that at face value. And then I, I was like, this is so curious. Like are so many people have been traumatized by horses. Like they've had these terrible horse experiences. And then the more that I, I was like, I, I gotta like ask more questions. And so I started asking people about their fear. And what I discovered was what they were sensing inside of them was alertness. And if we could talk about it as alertness and a heightened sense of awareness around a thousand pound animal that you're not used to being around, you have no competency of, it's really smart. And so if you can give yourself permission to be more alert and aware rather than afraid, it's like, there's the whole part of us. There's a whole lane that we can operate in, in awareness and that's one of the things that I teach are these four channels of awareness that mammals have. And, and if we can be more aware and, and stay more consistently aware, there's a lot less to be afraid of because we're actually, 
adjusting to what's happening in the moment and we're keeping ourselves safe. So one of the reasons we're driven by fear is because we're on autopilot and being around other mammals that are checked out is actually very dangerous. Mm. It's not safe. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you describe autopilot for a human? So when, what, what, what does that look like? Or what is what mindlessness like? activity where you're lost in your thoughts. So you, it, it might look you know, like you're doing, you're multitasking and you think you're good at it. And, but meanwhile, you're on the phone and you're making a list and you're doing all these behaviors, but you mm. actually have no idea what's going on within your body. And you don't really know what's going on with the other people in the room or what's happening around you because you're pretty much in your head. Lack of self-awareness. Lack of self-awareness, but it's mm. not just self-awareness. It's, it's awareness of self internally and what's happening around you. And so most people that are scared don't ha they don't actually have a handle of their own awareness and they usually swing from numbness to being hyper vigilant. Ooh. And so mm. the zone we're shooting for is this calm alert place that I call ease where you are absolutely aware but you're you've grown some faith in yourself because you've practiced it enough that you're going to stay aware so you can handle what changes around you as it comes. So you're, and that's how the horses live. That that's how their whole, their whole existence is in enough awareness that they can adapt when needed. And that they're, they're only afraid when they need to be. Yeah. And that makes so much sense too, because yeah. as a kid, you're taught, well, don't freak out if the dog starts barking and jumping up at you because they're really just happy or that's just that's just how they are never mind the fact that they might have bad manners but right. <laughs> yeah you we're taught to not freak out right and and it's like when when my dogs bark or I, and I'll notice sometimes when other people's dogs bark and they'll yell at them and the dog's like, but I actually, this is my partnership commitment to you as I'm supposed <laughs> to let you know, yeah. part of our agreement is that you feed me and I love you and we do things together and this is our territory. And so I bark to let you know there's a potential threat. And so instead of thanking them and saying, Hey, what do you see? Like, something alerted you and you alerted me. You did exactly what your what this relationship is designed to do. This is how you were evolved to be in my life. And so instead of thanking it, I always thank my dogs and say, let's check it out. Aww. And then they stop. Well, they stop because they did, they got the signal across. <laughs> and so they're not big barkers. And so, but yeah, we do the same thing to each other where it's like, don't freak out. And it's like, but something alerted me that we needed to pay attention to, even if it's no big deal. But yeah. if we suppress that, we end up, we're like in the dark. And so that awareness piece is, it's a game changer for us. I want to shift the conversation to the concept of the instrument of you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a writer, I loved that passage when you introduced it. <laughs> that was beautiful with the violin and such. Thank but you. how can we use this, this quote unquote instrument to improve our outlook on lives when things don't go the way we had hoped and or planned for them to go? So the instrument of you is the concept that you as a being in the world are, you bring a unique tone and texture and, and presence where you go. And, um, and that, that instrument of you needs its own maintenance. So there's, you know, you're out in the world doing what you do and playing the music that you play out in the world and like the strings break, you know, or it got, it falls out of tune. Like if we stayed with like the violin metaphor and it needs care. And so in order for it to go into the world, and play with others <laughs> and be able to, to carry its beautiful tone and, and, and have impact that, you know, doesn't hurt our ears. <laughs> we actually have to take care of that instrument. And so, and there's a, a self-interest, which is that it's, it's a lovelier instrument for us to play on our own and in our own lives. And then the other piece is like, well, how do, when I carry myself into the world, what, what am I, what impact am I having? What impact is my instrument having in all of the places that I take it, all of the relationships? And if I haven't been taking care of myself, 
and I'm missing strings and I'm out of tune and I'm, I'm kind of a mess. I'm taking that into all my relationships and all the systems that I operate in and making noise or none. I, I can't, I don't, I can't even make any noise because I have no strings and that limping along kind of with like this broken instrument, I think is, is how, how many of us have, have been living. And, um, and it's, you know, and it is a self-care crisis, but it's also not realizing how much our self-care impacts others. Yeah. Well, and what I love about this is that you, you talk about self-care in a way that, Hey, there's nothing wrong with it. It's caring for yourself and there's nothing, I guess there's nothing greedy or, or antisocial about, about, about it. Yeah. I think we're, I mean, it's again with the animals, I, I've, I've really like never seen an animal forego a need. Like right now you're drinking water, which is beautiful. Like your body told you to do it and you listened and yet. I mean, how many times a day does our body give us signals of what it needs? Like sit down, get up, drink water, go to the restroom. And we, we say no, and I've never seen an animal do that there or a child. And, and it's, it's why they get mad at adults because we're like their body told them they had a need. They, they tried literally to tell- peed on themselves. Mom totally. and dad. They tried to tell us we said no. And then they're like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and I think that when we start to talk about self-care on this level, because what we're really talking to about is, are we really adjusting to pressures inside and around us, or are we just suppressing those? And so even something like needing water is like, and has impact on that pressure system. Like when we start to get dehydrated or hungry, blood sugar changes, or there's tension in our muscles from standing or sitting from moving or not moving, we're holding all that tension in us. And so right there, you've got a self-care crisis that has nothing to do with like, and then we call it like selfish and it's like, but you're literally like your body, it's your body telling you it's, it's a biological system to designed for you to survive. Like, how is this a selfish, greedy behavior, but it's where it starts. It's, Mm. it starts at that level. And then we carry it into like, I won't take the day to myself, you know, because I don't really need it. And it would be the selfish thing to do. And so there's a spectrum of self-care crisis. And I think at the beginning, you know, on one end of that spectrum is that we ignore the signals of our bodies all day. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head with the self-care selfish, (laughs) but I mean, you combine the two words, caring for self. And it, it really should go without saying that we're not talking about overindulgence while right. laying down on the couch, watching four hours of the Ozark. <laughs> well, it might, it might involve that or that. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like one of my self-care practices and, you know, in the book, um, it really, it like tries, I try to help people look at like, what are the daily things that you do to care for all the parts of yourself? And they can be very simple. And so one of the things that I do is a couple times a day, I go out and wander around and just look around. I call it noticing things. And I just go like, look and see what I see. And I do that with my horse herd. So I go out in the pastures and I hang out with them and follow them around. And I always, it's like something amazing always happens out there, but it's, there are times when I'm really busy and I, I can only do it for five minutes, but I found that even just going and doing something, like getting up and going outside and looking at trees for five minutes, right. It's just, I'm moving my body I'm getting some air I'm getting outside of myself, getting outside of my thinker, letting my curiosity lead me. Like I'm back into my body and getting regrounded and it's a complete perspective shift. And it addresses all the parts of me. So I'm just speaking of a practice that works for me. We all get to design our own, but we've got to figure out like there's these core parts of our wellness that we need to attend to. And all it takes is little moments throughout the day to tune in and figure out what works for you. I love that you said that you just go out and explore and just notice things because mm-hmm. about, oh, I'm not even going to guess how long I've been doing it. I was told that, that I need to meditate. 
uh, because, <laughs> because I'm so high <laughs> strong and I'm like, well, that's never going to happen. But then I thought, huh, well, what if I, what if I unplug while I'm running and that'll be my form of meditation. I can concentrate on my breathing and on my steps and making sure that my process is going right. You know, I'm 46. So I got to really watch my posture, make sure I'm not going to blow out my back or right. pull, a, pull a hammy because Lord knows once you pass a certain age, yep. it takes a little bit longer to recover, but, uh, oh my gosh, it is just incredible to, uh, to see and hear all the different sounds yeah. uh, of the neighborhood. And I'm in the burbs and across from our neighborhood is, um, is a ranch that I don't think they're ever going to sell it. So it's a ranch with cows. And I just love hearing them, you know, hear them make their little moo sounds. And yeah. then every now and then there'll be one of them kind of just like, you know, it'll be looking at me like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, yeah. You're going to make a great steak one day, buddy. <laughs> but, oh boy. <laughs> but I mean, but they're so, but you know, kidding aside, they're, they're so cute and they're little babies and they're big, gigantic, chubby ones. And they're brown ones with white spots and black ones with white spots. And some of them have little horns and uh, it's just, uh, it's so relaxing. And then I'm running and then I realize that I'm running too slow to exercise <laughs> my heart. But uh, no, it's, it's great to just notice things instead of getting, I guess getting stuff jammed in my ears, no matter how, no matter how much I think I'm learning or being entertained. Yeah. It's a great practice noticing things. I'm, I have a Facebook group called noticing things and I post on there. I try to post daily, but it's not perfect, <laughs> but I take photographs of things that I notice and then write about them. And I've been doing it for years and, but then January 1st, I decided I'm going to try to do it every day. And I've been, I'm like, maybe this is the next book, but, um, and it's one of the practices in my, in the human herd, at, like teaching people how to do that practice of noticing things. And it really does call upon that mammal part of us. Cause you, if you're really tired and your body doesn't want to move or it's not able to, you can stay in one place and notice things, but if movement feels good and you are able to you know, and it, whatever pace is right for you, but the exercise is really about allowing your curiosity to be drawn wherever it is. And it does help draw us out of our, our thinking in a way that's important. And then looking back at what you noticed and what the, that might tell you there's messages out there of, you know, like all I've done this exercise all over the world. Cause I've been doing it for a long time that, that practice and everywhere I go, I see incredible things going on around me. If I actually pay attention and usually it does ground me or it'll spark a new thought that I would never have had, or a new idea that I would never have had, had I not been paying attention to something outside of myself. And so it helps us get out of that ego and out of that, those automatic thoughts and it's, it's, I think where a lot of innovation is born or creativity. And so it's a great place to be creative, even if you don't consider yourself a creative type or an artist to be able to go explore, you just never know what you're going to find out there. And again, back to that childlike piece or with the animals, if something new in the world that they haven't seen, that's novel, it lights them up inside. And so the same thing happens to us. It lights up our whole inner world. And so that's good for us. That's like beautiful spiritual blood flow. Yeah. Um, yeah. All of that. What she said. <laughs> All of that and more. <laughs> All of that. Yeah. Well, and um, yeah, I had a conversation with, with, um, with Caroline Williams about this very thing when it comes to uh, getting out and just exploring and noticing things. It wasn't this it wasn't using those specific words, but we were talking, it, this was in the context of, of getting out and moving. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we we're like, well, you know, if, if Freddie was a, the v, a VP of whatever corporation, um, would he rather Caroline and Freddie sit at their desk <laughs> beating themselves up because they <laughs> don't know how they're going to solve this incredibly difficult concept by their 5:30 deadline. Oh wait, there's 45 minutes to go. Or would they rather Freddie and Caroline go out for, you know, 20 minutes at about one o'clock with plenty of time to spare and reset. Yeah. And I think the answer is pretty clear. Oh yeah. I, a lot of the people that I coach, the practice of 
taking a walk about, or I'll call it taking your animal body for a walk or settling in, like settling into that, like your, yourself or, or, and doing those resets. A lot of my, the teams that I've worked with, um, organizations that I've worked with, they, they now do that as part of their meeting agenda. And they, a lot of them do, um, on the move meetings and keep the sitting in one place, talking to a minimum because, we really are not designed to do that. We're not designed to, to be um, sitting in one spot all day in our thinking brain. That's just not, we're not biologically designed that way. It's really bad for us. Right, absolutely. Um, before we do a lightning round, I did want to ask you something else that I thought was interesting in the book, and that is the concept of disappointment being a human construct. I'm of the I'm of the I'm of the thought that everything is a construct because mm. we're story we're story creating machines. Mm-hmm. That's how we that's just how we function. Yeah. But how can we how can we train ourselves to to not let this human construct disappoint mm-hmm. or th- this human construct to lord over us? Interesting. Um, the what I talk about in the book is the power of desire. And the, this idea of disappointment, um, again, with other mammals, when they have the experience of, um, of loss or, you know, hurt or, or fear, they're going to make adjustments to try and, um, get their needs met. Humans (laughs) have a, a hurt or a fear. We have something that's happened that's upset us. And we sit in one place and think about and judge what happened. And that would be disappointment. We judge the wrong that has happened to us. And we ruminate about that for, I don't know, 10, 20 years sometimes, right? And we call them resentments. We know how to hold a grudge. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's incredible. And, you know, and animals don't live that way. And so on the one hand, it's good to think about where things have not gone well so we can learn from them. Yeah. But if you, if we break disappointment down to it's, you know, something's happening that we don't like. Right. And, and so, and if we focus there, there, it's kind of a dead end. It doesn't, it, it, there's nowhere to go. It, we just keep talking about the thing that we don't like. There's this whole other world. And, the, and it, it is the world of uh, where other mammals reside, which is what am I wanting in this moment? Because they're very good at pivoting. And so in that moment where we realize that we're really stuck in disappointment, the pivot is what am I wanting or needing in this moment? And from there, there's lots of choices. I might not get my first, second, or even third choice, but there, but, but I'm still in a different realm where I can create something or I can try to get this need met in another way versus just staring at the disappointment. My dog Sparrow doesn't have the physical capability to open the backyard, but damn it, he's going to (laughs) dig himself out. (laughs) That's his desire. Yeah. He's not disappointed by the fence. No. And he's going to create a way. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. It's a great example. They're, they're amazing. They're like, he's not sitting there writing a book about the fence that has disempowered his life. (laughs) He is digging a hole to his heart's desire and It's a beautiful example of a empowered canine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Look at that. (laughs) So um, I'd love to do a a lightning round with you, Beth. Okay. What was the last book you read and what are you currently reading? To look at my, um, The Art of Solitude um, by Stephen Batchelor is the last book that I read. And then I'm currently reading um, a book called Trying Not to Try, which is really good. And it's, um, it's, yeah, it's an incredible book about like ancient Japanese wisdom and modern science. And yeah, it's, it's in philosophy. It's incredible, incredible book. What is a horse pro tip for anybody about to encounter a horse for the first time? I feel like maybe we went over this earlier in the interview. (laughs) Uh, be, yeah, being aware, um, I would say, um, letting the horse lead the introduction and encounter and noticing how they greet versus 
how we might be inclined to greet. We're very dominant as a species with how we we're, we're very unaware of how we come across to others and other species, even, even our own. And so, but our first encounter is really, um, can be quite a moment of learning about ourselves. And um, so I think being a little bit more open to the diversity of a greeting. You work with CEOs and managers. What is a common concern that employees and teams can work on to fix? Um, I think that the self-care piece, I think people say yes to a lot because they're afraid of how they're going to be perceived as a worker. And there is not enough psychological safety to be able to talk about people's needs in the workplace. And so there's a real wellness crisis there. So I think for leaders is to be able to create an environment where people can really talk about what they need in order to do their best work and to feel more free to do it in a unique way. And that takes some real relationship building and trust building on the leader's part. The leader has to lead that. What can horses teach us about adversity? <laughs> They're an incredibly resilient and resourceful species. And the most important thing that they, they do very hard things and adapt to incredible changes, but they do it together. So they, they as a herd, they rely on the group for their survival. And that, that's a, an important lesson for us. Best place for people to learn about Beth and Stendig? The circleupexperience.com. The circleupexperience.com is where you go to learn all about what Beth is doing with these incredible creatures. The book is called The Human Herd, Awakening Our Natural Leadership. Excellent. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Have a great day. Me. Thanks, you too.